Awesome. Yeah. Definitely so this is less than <laughs> well, this is <laughs> really you. exciting. A beautiful studio and a huge studio too. We were doing some research on you today and reading about some of your background and things you've done and different ways you think about your art. And it's been super interesting. We are always looking for a, I guess, a, a diversity in guests or all types of different people and like what you do, these landscapes. And I didn't even know that this was also a school. It's definitely a really, really beautiful addition to our, our roster of people, I guess. Yeah. So, so uh, kind of, just because we read a little bit already, but to kind of give you the wheel, like how would you describe your work or introduce yourself as someone that's not familiar with your work at all? Um, in terms of my work in general or art that I create? I guess we could start with your art. Okay. Um, they are landscapes that I really want people to dissolve into. Um, so they're created with layers and layers of paint. Uh, it's oil mixed with wax. And the last couple of layers, they are melted with a heating lamp. And at the same time, some gold leaf is added because I'm really um, loving the effect of sun shimmering on um, and certain places, especially water, but also just kind of different times of the day and different seasons. And I, I start out with watercolor sketches everywhere I go, um, even if it's around the Boston area, foliage season or summer or winter, we're heading to New Hampshire this weekend, so I'm really excited to be doing some sketches there. Um, but also all of our travels, we um, actually were just able to get out to Croatia for two weeks. Oh, wow. wow which was super exciting. So I'm finishing that little piece for someone right now, the tiny one with the sailboat. Oh, very nice. um, that's based on one of my watercolor sketches that I did there. And um, just about figuring out whether this is finished or not, because I kind of want to have this somewhat unfinished feel yeah. to it. Um, so you can, the viewer can sort of complete the scene on their own. Um, and it's not completely representational so it's a mixture between realistic and abstract how does the wax uh work into it i guess in in terms of like the oil paint would that be considered or would they be considered encaustic paintings that's a medium i don't really know a lot about yeah so encaustic is when you use wax but then you're doing it on the surface and you're melting it and it's flat so it has this very lacquered look Mm. Uh, what I'm doing is using cold wax and blending it directly with the oil paint and then melting sections of it, not the whole thing. So it's a bit different. So it's cold wax that's that's melted as opposed to using specific encaustic tools. Wow. So would the function of that be to build up texture in certain areas and kind of work it down in other places? Yeah, yeah. So it's really an attempt to break down barriers between different levels so that you are feeling like you're in this place and the trees are blending in with the architecture and the water is you, you know you see reflections of everything but everything is kind of part of one thing um, and one big world and we're just tiny little specks in that world yeah, because for the for the viewer, the person, someone listening, like these are very, I wouldn't call them like completely abstract. They're representational, but they're very, uh, you know, thick and have so much volume and, and feeling to them. Yeah, they're really expressive and beautiful and a kind of city, uh, urban architecture landscape and also regular landscape, you know, which is really beautiful work. I'm, and I'm wondering, too, is some of these like literal three dimensional elements of some of those paintings, some of the paint, is it like... Is, are those the wax elements or no, some of the... so that's actually tissue paper that oh is my added in and then painted over. Um, and it's a relatively new element for me. I started doing this at the start of last year after coming back from Art Basel, Miami. Wow. And what really hit me there in terms of inspiration is this effect of going in and out of 3D to 2D yeah. and also the use of gold. Um, I did use gold leaf a lot when I did my college thesis, but then I sort of forgot about it. And um, at the beginning of last year, it just all kind of came full circle. Wow. Um, and so I love what it does because it completely changes based on the lighting 
and it's really tough to photograph, unfortunately. Oh, the gold. Because, the gold. Yeah, oh, I believe because it. Because if you, and I've used professional photographers to do it, and they're having a hard time because it either shows up black if you have a full-on yeah. flash on it, um, or it's, it, it changes so much. But it's so amazing to have a piece like that at home and just see different elements kind of sparkle. Yeah, it gives um, it an element of day. life too. Yeah. It captures the light that way, refracts it that way. That's really interesting. Did you go to school in Boston or was it elsewhere? No, I went to Cornell. Oh, okay. Um, so nice. I did my bachelor um, in painting, BFA at Cornell. And then I came to Boston to do my master's in arts administration. Oh, amazing. So they called it business school for art people. <laughs> it was more centered on nonprofits and how do you fundraise and how do you yeah. make a nonprofit survive as opposed to the for-profit sector, which is what I was hoping to do is how do you earn money with your art, sure. right? <laughs> um, and when I started the, the BU program, I was actually managing an art gallery and I was just really interested in, you know, how do you build up a business? How do you, you know, all the marketing strategies and they were kind of catered more towards, here's how you ask for donations. Yeah. So. Yeah, I'm also I'm really curious, too, because you, you seem to be, you know, this prolific and talented and really active artist. But it also seemed like in your background and in your education, and everything you do, you seem to be really, really involved in the actual arts industry. You know what I mean? Which is really different from most of the people that we've interviewed, because a lot of the people we've interviewed are either emerging artists or people who are working um, uh, in a more... I guess DIY. I don't mean that. I mean, you're probably DIY too, in the sense that you're doing all of this yourself, but I guess I mean DIY in a way that they may not be involved with a, a gallery or, or different institutions and stuff. So it's really cool to be sitting down with somebody who, who is, or who has that direct hands-on experience. And I guess I'm also interested too, because, um, I guess I'm just kind of interested in how, how that, that interest started for you besides just carrying on as somebody with a studio practice and painting and selling a piece here and there. How did you get from, I guess, there, or if you were there, to being kind of involved more in the arts industry? I guess, I guess maybe a more simplified question. That was like an How essay of a question. How did I get into the art galleries? Well, not, not necessarily that, but I guess what did it look like before that? You know, were you painting as a, as a teenager or through school or things like that? Um, so I started painting in high school mm -hmm. because I, as, as a little girl, wanted to be a fashion designer. And when we moved to the States, um, originally from Moldova, which is one of the former Soviet republics, hmm. I moved when I was 13. And my mom meet, met an artist. She was told um, that I would need a portfolio to get into school. And that artist convinced her that I need to learn how to do everything, you know, the landscapes, the portraits, the still lifes. And I started taking classes and I really, really liked them. But when the time came to actually apply to fashion schools, I went to FIT for a portfolio review. And their very first question was, you don't even know how to sew what are you doing here? <laughs> and I was like, wow, okay, I really should have um, looked into that a little more. And, but then all the art schools accepted me and gave me scholarships and I it just kind of fell into it. Yeah. Um, but of course, getting out of college, um, there is that syndrome of the starving artist and mm -hmm. I just really didn't know. And what sucks about art schools is that they don't know the, yeah. te the professors don't know what you should be doing and how to go about it and um, and even though I was approaching them with questions about well, what does somebody with an art degree do after she graduates right I did not get any answers so I um, didn't know what to do and first I worked for a firm because I speak four languages. Um, I, I worked for a company that was dealing with international students and bringing them over to work at all these um, theme parks and hotels and stuff in the summer. But then I realized that I really miss the art world um, and I just want to be a part of it in some capacity. So I started applying to galleries and that's how I kind of fell into the gallery world. And um, moved through three galleries until I was 
proposed to become a director of a new space that was opening up. A new gallery? Um, a new gallery on Newberry Street. Yeah. Um, wow. And I said, yes, I'll try it. You and said, let's go for let's it. Let's go for <laughs> it. Yeah. Um, and I was um, running it and we opened a satellite branches in Palm Beach in New York wow. and DC. Um, so I was involved for seven and a half years. And then I left when I was pregnant with my second child. Wow. Yeah. So through the, that time from, from school or just kind of kicking around and, and making art and stuff, and you were in these three galleries, did you set out to have, you said you had a job, uh, was it translating or dealing with international students? Students, students gotcha. Yeah, yeah. And then you started working in the galleries. Was that, were you like maintaining uh, a studio practice or like working out of your apartment or something and just working at a gallery just because you wanted to be there or was it, or did you have more of like an educational mission as to what you wanted to get I from it? I actually completely let go of my practice when oh, wow. I was working for galleries because there is a very interesting and it's, it's, it's funny because when Clubhouse opened up um, at the beginning of um, last year, I guess. Is that a, is that a, um, it's the new audio, um, social media. Oh, app. okay. I, oh. I'm actually not uh, even familiar with it. Really? Yeah. yeah. It's, um, it's pretty interesting. I, it kind of got tiring, but, um, the idea is that, um, a bunch of people from all over the world get together and there is a particular topic that some people equated to kind of like a fireside, um, chat. Oh, cool. And you all chat about it. So there are a bunch of rooms and you kind of get into a room. Wow. Um, there are a bunch of rooms where dealers got together and were trying to talk to artists and kind of explain their thinking versus what the artists are thinking. And there, there's a huge clash between galleries and artists mm -hmm. because yeah. there's a misunderstanding from the point of view of an artist of what the gallery owes them or should do for them or how they should operate. Um, and at the same time, there is a lack of respect from galleries towards artists. So when I was working in a gallery, one of the first things that I learned was you judge people when they walk in. Mm -hmm. And if it's somebody who looks like an artist, you ignore them because they're not going to buy anything. So mm -hmm. because you are... <laughs> Because you're working on commission, why would you want to be wasting your time? Yeah. Right. Essentially. So over the years, I kind of developed almost this um, barrier. Like I didn't want to be associated with artists. With artists. Yeah. Because I was on the other side. I was on the, you know, gallery consulting side. Um, of course, I wanted to be associated with the artists that we represented because you're supposed to promote them. Right. And, you're selling you know, art. Exactly. Right. You're selling their art. And... But at the same time, there are so many artists who would walk in, have no idea what the gallery is about, uh -huh. what the gallery focuses on, and just try to show us the portfolio, which has nothing to do with the, the, the focus, because every gallery has a focus. Yeah. Um, no research whatsoever. So, you know, kind of like with applying for jobs, you want to research the company mm -hmm. that you're applying for and um, fit, make sure that you fit in somehow or there are certain artists that are like you and you could kind of blend or that they're looking for somebody outside of the scope of what they're doing. And there are just you know, so many people who didn't do any of that. Yeah, I didn't um, even speak the language really. Yeah, okay. yeah, and didn't really understand how how things work so um so it's been this very interesting dichotomy i did not paint for 10 years wow oh. and during that that 10 years that was when you worked at these three galleries yeah and were you between these galleries for 10 years and then you went to work for this this larger one no i worked for um a few galleries for two years oh, and gotcha. then it was almost eight years at the one that i managed the larger one the right larger the one newberry street managed. and yeah. the different yeah. wow yeah they were and, all in newberry street oh wow um and it and it's a very incestuous word <laughs> oh newberry street is yeah. oh gotcha and especially gallery galleries on newberry street everybody knows i'm sure it's a really small community yeah is it like would yeah. you say because like with a gal with an art gallery at that level, they're probably, um, I got glitter all over me. Great. I, I love it. Um, but I don't mind it. Um, would you say like uh, the average amount of employees is like under 10 people yeah. or something? Yeah. Maybe how many, like two, three, four? Um, it, it ranges. Um, 
it, it depends on what the setup is um, mm -hmm. because there um, there are two different setups. There's a setup which is which was the first gallery that I worked for, where there is. Um, well, it's not a democracy. It's like a totalitarian regime, right. basically. So, <laughs> so there's like the owner, ship. right? And there's the owner, and then he has a bunch of minions that are doing things for him. Okay. And he's the one that talks to the clients. He's the one that makes all the decisions, and you're just there to, you know, do paperwork and file stuff. And yeah. Would that be what sure. a, a gallerist is? One of, like, the, the minions? Or would the gallerist <laughs> be the owner? The gallerist would be the owner. The owner, okay. Yeah, the minions would be gallery assistants. Gotcha. <laughs> yes. He's the real So that is... Uh, <laughs> so that's the, uh, the kind of the most common setup. Gotcha. Right? But then um, there's another setup, which is a lot less common, and there are only three galleries on Newberry Street that operate that way. Oh, interesting. Um, and it's the commission-based, mm -hmm. um, where everybody is a consultant, and they get commissions, and everybody talks to the clients, and they're trying to develop relationships, and... And they're hmm. um, all knowledgeable about the art and the owner is pretty much he's not there hmm. Hmm. Um, he operates out of somewhere yeah. so um, so with that being said on a street like Newberry Street where there's a limited amount of galleries and each one has like under 10 or 20 employees that's probably like a whole art world on this fancy street in Boston that's like less than 100 people yeah that's like a really small community I think that's pretty interesting because I, I'm not like in like super familiar with a lot of the community or people on Newberry Street, but there's like Newberry Street galleries and there's SOA, which mm -hmm. is like Harrison Avenue. Yeah. Like, are there are there any I'm, I'm missing? Because in my head, those are like the two like those are the two gallery big oriented. Spots. Yeah. Um, and then there are studio spaces. So there's yeah. um, there's a big studio area in Fort Point. Um, oh yeah. And um, there. Are, you know, kind of areas throughout um, that are doing their open studio events. But in terms of the big gallery spots, it's either Newberry Street or South End. And there are a lot of galleries from Newberry Street that moved over to the South End because mm -hmm. the rents were cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, so that makes sense. Yeah. So I guess I'm I'm also really interested in your in your time with on on Newberry Street. Was was your gallery commission based? Yeah. Oh, okay. So, and you would have gallery assistants, just like, how many artists did you work with? Or like, how many do you think would be represented by your gallery at a time? Probably 25 to 35. Interesting. Um, and it was a mix of dead guys. Dead guys? Dead guys. Like oh, Warhol dead guys. Got it. Okay. <laughs> and Lichten, well, yeah. Is Lichtenstein still alive? I, I don't, really I don't think so. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> I feel bad that I don't know. Um, I don't think so. Um, Warhol, uh, Picasso, Dali, wow. Chagall, um, established people like mm -hmm. Jeff Koons yeah. and wow. Murakami, and it was it was more of a pop focus, mm -hmm. um, and then um, a number of contemporary artists that are kind of mid career. Mm -hmm. Yeah that still that have some museum coverage or maybe they don't um but they're kind of moving them towards that was that's, there oh go ahead i was gonna say that's interesting also to think about the scope of this that if there's probably not a lot of artists that are working contemporarily that are represented on newberry street and so altogether like probably not as large as a community as people think it is if looking at those numbers i guess yeah i'm also pretty i think it's really interesting to note too that i I uh, imagine you can see how disconnected we are from this. <laughs> it's like we we love it, but like I'm I'm all, I also thought that it was mostly contemporary artists. Like, and it must have like I, I guess I'm also wondering too. Was it? Uh, was there any magic to like housing and selling like a Warhol at at most points, or was it just like oh that's another one, <laughs> or like was it just another day at work, or do you think it was kind of exciting selling these like works by dead guys or popular <laughs> people? Um, well, I sold a Warhol to Kanye. So that was really? Kind of exciting. <laughs> yeah. Did you meet uh, you? You met him, or yes, he was just I in? Met him and in I had no Street? idea who he was, and it was it was, <laughs> <laughs> it was hilarious. Um, yeah. So this was, um, gosh, like fifteen years ago, probably. Wow. It was um, two thousand seven, or yeah, probably two thousand seven, or yeah, it was definitely before the crash, and it was over Christmas time, and. 
Um, there are lots of folks walking around that were collecting like money for charity hmm. and these two guys walk in and I'm just assuming that like that's who it is and um, and he asks we had a Jeff Koons in the window and he asks you know can you show it to me and I'm like well and, and you have to go through this questioning phase and make sure that they're actually legit yeah so I start asking so are you involved in the arts and he says yes but on the music side I'm like all right <laughs> cool did you go to school for music he's like yeah but I dropped out <laughs> and in my head I'm like oh great yeah definitely not qualified and <laughs> um and then we kind of just and he's like but Jeff Koons like I always loved him and I always loved um I always wanted to meet him like yeah you know, like so all everybody. of us, right? Um, oh, but from his perspective, it's probably somebody it happened, totally could have yeah, met, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and then uh, it's like, well, you know, I'd still love to see it. I'm like, all right, fine. So I, you know, I took the sculpture out of the window. He looked at it and he's like, I'm going to, you know, give you my email address and send me an image and all the info and I'll, I'll be in touch. Um, and in the meantime, I'm realizing that there's commotion in the back and everybody's like giggling and obviously know something that I don't um, and I'm starting to spell his name and I completely misspell it and misspell his email address and um, so he had to actually fix it um, and then of course as they left they're like you have no idea who that was I'm like, no <laughs> like that was Kanye I'm like who's Kanye <laughs> oh my um, so yeah and then he kind of he turned into a big client and I actually I had to I was so nervous about selling him Warhol's Maryland like a few years down the road that I went and took some public speaking classes so I could really get my pitch right and um, and he bought it and wow. it was great and then he bought some Damien Hirst and wow so it was, it was cool did, did he end up buying the Jeff Koons piece too yeah that was oh, a little wow. one yeah that was his first one that he bought yeah. he must have a pretty big contemporary art collection he probably does at this point yeah, I mean, I've been out of the gallery world for like eight years now, so I don't know who is working with him or who took over or whether right. he's working with the gallery at all. But I wouldn't be surprised if someone at his level probably has a bunch of people or something. Yeah, yeah. Well, probably does. Yeah. Probably has a lot of wall space yeah, that's to true. worry about. Multiple houses, most likely. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but. Interesting. Now, I'm also curious, like you, so you've been out of the gallery world for eight years, how did that transition out of running the, uh, a, a, a gallery at the level of selling these these really prestigious and, and high worth pieces? Like, how did you decide to leave that life, and why? Why did you Why did you leave your gallery? I. It's funny to be saying this now, but I left because I wasn't allowed to work part time. Oh, it was full time or nothing. It was full time or nothing. It was, <laughs> um, and I was I was pregnant with my second child, and I realized that um, I actually I was burnt out because uh, it's all sales all mm -hmm. the time, and you could have a really good month, you know, when Kanye comes in, uh, <laughs> but then you're back down to zero, and it's just this constant roller coaster. And it was also not just me, but it was a team of salespeople that I was managing and managing their moods and yeah. managing mm -hmm. the boss and his expectations. So it was, it was just really, really stressful. And I, I went away on a retreat with my old art teacher who was the guy that did not get me into fashion schools. And, <laughs> um, and I realized, so I was painting for three days in Italy and it was, it was incredible because I realized what a huge part of me was dormant yeah. while, uh, and, and I wasn't accessing for like over 10 years wow. um, because of being in the gallery world. So when I got back, I approached my boss and I said, look, I, most of the work that we're doing is email based anyways. Can I please stay home, you know, once a week and then work the rest of the week? And he's like, no. You have to put in 150%. Otherwise, oh, I don't want you here. I'm like, really? <laughs> After seven and a half years of managing wow. your galleries, this is how we're going to leave this. Yeah. And I left. Good for you, honestly. Um, and, you know, in COVID times and ever, you know, I know that since he has been allowing people to work part time. Oh, wow. And he's <laughs> totally cool with it. But, wow. you know, someone had to make a statement. Yeah. 
I'm curious too, when you, um, you mentioned you were on a trip to Italy and you were painting again yes. for the first time after 10 years. Mm -hmm. what, what did that work look like at the time upon your return? It was raw. Um, it was a lot of crying. Um, wow. Just because it almost felt like I forgot what this feels like um, or what, um, what this is for. Hmm. And it, it was just very revelatory, I guess, in terms of what my heart and soul needed and I wasn't giving. Um, so it took a while to kind of get back and I always use the excuse of, well, you know, family comes first, I can only come to the studio once a week. Mm -hmm. uh, but then gradually it moved up to twice a week and then it was three times a week and, and now it's every day. Um, and, and now I, so there was, there was a really long time when I was afraid to call myself an artist because to me, if you're not doing it full time, it's just, um, what do they call them? Sunday hobbyists, like weekend right? painters yeah, or something. Yeah, weekend painters. So, um, so I just wanted to be serious about it before mm -hmm. I officially called myself an artist, um, and, which was silly because if you, if you paint and if it's in your soul and if you're teaching people how to paint, then you are an artist. Um, hmm. So, yeah. So at what time did you become, because we're sitting in a school right now yeah. also, we haven't yeah. talked about that yet. What, yeah. At what point did you start teaching art? I started teaching almost right after I left. I, for a second there, when I had my second one, because with, the, with my first child, it was November, 2008, right in oh. the <laughs> smack in the middle of the crash wow. um, and we were in the midst of an auction season we put I put together this beautiful auction it was over a hundred lots and we had all these people invited and it was the day that Lehman Brothers crashed oh my goodness and it was just awful and then my first one came three weeks early and my boss called me when he was four weeks old and he said it's either that you come back to work right now even though I promised you three months or I start firing people. Oh wow! So I only had four weeks with my first baby, and I was a bit, a little bit resentful about that. So I thought, well, maybe I'll try the whole home, stay-at-home mom thing. Yeah. Uh, but that only worked for about six months because I was bored. Out of my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Could not do it, and I thought, well, I now have a four-year-old. I really don't see anything in terms of our education in Boston mm -hmm. that I think works. Um, so how about I just try it on my own? Yeah. And I just started doing little classes for him and a group of his friends. And then very quickly it grew. And then in 2016, it got a Best of Boston Award. Wow. Which we as a gallery have been trying to get for years. So this was a complete surprise. Wow. And then after that, it was like a household name. And now the camp is insane. I'm exhausted. <laughs> um, is the camp happening right now? The camp is happening right now. Wow. Yeah, so I just, as you guys were walking in, I was kicking the last kids out. And the counselors, <laughs> I think the counselors are still sitting there because we have a quest oh, they hang tomorrow. Out? Um, well, they have to finish prepping for the quest. And they were taking their time today, even though I said I have an interview. I have, guys have to be out by 4.15. So, <laughs> so what yeah. does the quest look like? Um, every Friday, we have um, a bunch of riddles at, that are based. So the, the concept of the school is that it's a mixture of art history, experimenting with materials, um, and being outdoors as much as we can. Um, so this week, for instance, we're doing the Middle East as a theme so that we learned all kinds of designs this week and they made these bowls using designs. So we had a very messy paper mache day <laughs> and then today was painting day. Um, and then tomorrow the quests are based on some of the information that we covered. Uh, like we had a treasure hunt and there's something that kind of looks like a mosque on the playground. So that's, um, so they had a riddle and they had to guess the word mosque. And, <laughs> um, and then, so it consists of word searches and pig pen codes and, oh, wow. um, 
action just maps that they follow and get to a certain place and they've all been really really into it so every single kid if they've been here for over two weeks tries to come up with his own quest oh that's <laughs> they, so engaging they take that's it very awesome. seriously yeah. <laughs> yeah so even my seven-year-old came up with a quest this week so. oh i love that <laughs> yeah. so I, I just have to point out too that like you must be so like your time must be so filled up so i want to say too thank you so much with all these responsibilities and projects going for sitting down with us yes and taking the time to do this thanks guys but also so you you're you have a family you have your own studio practice you're running a school you're represented by a gallery which i'd love to talk about in a minute too um we also saw that you design clothes now as well i'd love to talk about that in a minute too there's so much to cover (laughs) it seems like there's a lot to your story but like, do you like how, like, cause something that I struggle with a lot as an artist and with working with our show and stuff is that my time management is horrible. <laughs> you know, I am my, I'm a terrible scheduler, but I'm, I'm guessing with all of this experience you have and all of these projects that you have going, like, is that, do you have to be like disciplined and vigorous in the way you schedule these things? And was that a learning curve as well? It was, yeah. Um, it's, you have to be extremely, extremely organized and disciplined um, and I to make sure that I get to everything in the summer for instance um, well actually and during the school year as well I get up at 5 30 wow. um, I do um, a meditation practice I do some mindset training I try to get through client outreach first thing in the morning because I know um, for sales for oh art for sales. art for your personal art yeah, sale gotcha yeah. mm-hmm. Um, And also any sort of email communication Mm -hmm. first thing in the morning before the kids wake up. Um, (laughs) And then, because it's quiet. Um, Right. (laughs) And and then I have, you know, then it's it's show time. But I've also been hiring other teachers. Oh, cool. So that I could have a bit of a break. And I couldn't, like, I've been working on the commissioned painting for this week uh, while while another teacher is teaching. Um, and then I cooperate with a dance teacher um, across oh, the street. So he takes over for an hour and I could have a break and have um, some Zoom calls and um, in between. And then as I get home, um, I'm dealing with the fashion business. That's oh, incredible. So. It's utilizing oh, wow. every second. Yes. <laughs> I'm yeah. curious about the, the school as well. Is it, a, is it a, are these are these full time students like uh, younger students like throughout the school year or is it a program or? A bunch of them are full-time students during the school year. So they're not Um, going to public schools or anything like that. They're here. Oh, no, 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 no. Um, It's after school. Oh, okay. Gotcha. I was like, wow. After school (laughs) Saturday. Yeah, no, I I would kill myself. (laughs) Um, No. Uh, So yeah, after school and um, and weekends. Gotcha. um, During the school year. And then um, a rigorous summer program. Yeah. Wow. That's still a lot of time. That's really exciting to be focusing that much on art history at such a young age group. Because you said you have a seven-year-old in the class? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is it all the seven, seven-year-olds? seven It's from seven to 13. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it's a range. Yeah. That must be nice, too. Like, w- when you're teaching things like art history or, like, different motifs or different theories, like, with having that range of understanding or how, like, to different grades and stuff, like, is that cool seeing the older kids interact with the younger kids and how they respond to the material differently? Yeah, it's really amazing to watch, and I I've, I did that on purpose, um, Montessori style, yeah, uh, where they have mixed age groups because I definitely see that uh, older kids tend to act like chaperones or tutors mm. to the younger kids, and the younger kids look up to them, and um, so the quest, you know, they're watching the counselors do it, and then I yeah. had a really, really shy counselor last week, and. Um, who was working for me kind of this first time around and I was wondering, you know, how do I utilize her because I really need them to be upbeat and and playing with kids, but she is very artsy and she decided that she's going to teach um, an origami class. Oh, wow. And it was such a hit. And then all of these kids are sitting there like, oh, you didn't get the, you didn't get the ninja star here. Let me show you. So they're, I mean, it was like origami was the theme for the whole week because she introduced it. Um, and, and then they, they all come up with their own ideas. And we had this whole like cops and robbers um, game that's very involved 
Um, so there are a bunch of them making bracelets and they're shopkeepers and they sell those bracelets and they're buyers, but then they're also robbers and cops and, 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 and they're all making the rules by themselves. So <laughs> it's, awesome. um, so it's really complex. fascinating yeah, <laughs> to watch. I'm curious too, that I, I remember you said earlier that, um, at, uh, after leaving the gallery and, and starting, um, and focusing on your art, you, you mentioned that the school or teaching was one of the first objectives or one of the first thing, uh, endeavors that you, that you really dug into. I'm curious as to how you decided on that, or if you had, uh, a lot of, uh, any teaching experience before that, because like, I feel like that's a path a lot of, uh, professional artists end up on or have been through where they become professors or teachers or something like that. And I guess I'm just kind of wondering if, did you just say I'm qualified to do this, so I'm going to do it, or was teaching more of a passion? Or I so before I wanted to be a fashion designer mm-hmm. at the age of five, um, <laughs> I wanted to be a teacher. <laughs> gotcha. Um, and, and I did teach as a counselor um, throughout college um, at the summer camp that my old teacher was organizing, and okay. I really, really loved it. Um, so I thought I'm just gonna follow in his footsteps and and be a teacher. Um, but one of the main reasons why I decided to do it is because in terms of art programs that I saw, it's either very arts and craftsy, you know, here you are, make a bracelet um, or a wand or what have you, um, or you go into a museum like an MFA mm-hmm. and you're literally sitting there and copying artwork that's on the wall. Yeah. And I just thought that either one was very limiting because on one hand you're not really learning anything um you're just sort of playing and on the other hand it's all very um technique focused right and art history focused but there's no element of play and discovery Mm -hmm. and um so i wanted to do something that would have a little bit of both you learn about our history but you're not it's you know, like, like a paint night, right? You're yeah. not trying to copy exactly what Miro was doing or yeah. Picasso was doing. You're influenced by the ideas, but then you create your own version of it. Um, so we talk about um, cubism, for instance, but I don't expect them to sit there and copy a Picasso painting. Right. Yeah. I want them to understand cubism in their own terms and then come up with what they think looks like cubism. Well, it's interesting when you say that, because something that you said earlier was that after art school, you would experience not knowing or not being able to find the answer of what you're supposed to do next. And I completely relate to that. Um, I feel like a lot of people do. <laughs> and Boston being such a collegiate place, I feel like that's a story that I've heard a lot and people that are like in their mid to early 20s that have just left school. And it's like there is no translation of these are the techniques that you're learning. These are the like how you bring them into networking or how you bring them into an actual career or how you develop your own style even from what you've been taught and that kind of jump from this is what already exists to this is what I can bring to the table and bringing that into a legitimate practice is not something a lot of people teach other people I feel like so it's really interesting to hear about you doing that with kids too because to see well they'll be when they're that age group would be incredible yeah and I'm also um noticing too like I remember you said earlier as well that when you were in art school and in college and at that age that there was a lack of direction Mm. professionally or with you know real practical steps that you could take in your career and do you I guess I'm wondering how like was that what did that moment look like when you like when you realized that there were some pieces missing and and that you needed for your goals or and and how did you do them was it like personal research or did you seek out mentors or i i think i just sort of went with it um (laughs) there was no like kind of problem no defining moment or it was just kind of picking up skills as you went because it's interesting to know that you were this talented artist and you you clearly are taking initiative and learning things and teaching but you also must have like advanced business skills to be able to have done what you have done it's all learning on the job yeah i don't think any of that was taught in school which is a really inspiring answer (laughs) yeah okay i'm glad i'm glad glad it's inspiring Uh, i mean i'm i'm sad about the new generation Mm -hmm. that 
comes out of college and is clueless and they will most likely, I think the statistics are that 85% of art graduates are not going to be artists mm. yeah. because wow. um, they just don't know what to do with it. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I really wish that there was more direction and more and more answers. And even in the grad program, um, there's this expectation from college professors um, that if you do good enough work, somebody will find you, mm. Mm. which is not true at all. Yeah. You know, unless you do the legwork mm -hmm. and you help people find you, they're not going to find you. Just the fact that you have an Instagram account does absolutely nothing mm -hmm. yeah. unless you actually get in touch with folks and you go to art fairs and you do the research and, and, and contact people and try to make connections. Um, nothing happens. So there are all these artists that are sitting there and waiting and waiting and waiting to be found out and then they end up either being the best kept secret for the rest of their lives mm -hmm. and just quietly painting in their studios um, or they stop. Yeah. And what would you say, because I know you were talking earlier about how there are artists that will go into a gallery not knowing at all how it works and kind of pitch themselves completely the wrong way, which must be really detrimental when it's such a small community of gallerists also, that if you're somebody who's done that at all the galleries on Newbury Street one time a few years ago, it might look really bad later yeah, down the like road. Yeah, you're known as this dumbass, probably, <laughs> right? So what would you say to someone that is in that position that is trying to kind of learn these ropes? Like, is there, who would you talk to or what should you do? I would say do the research, you know, think about it as if you're applying for a job anywhere mm. else. If you were to go to, to go have an interview at, I don't know, um, Fidelity, right? Yeah. Or, or some, some firm, you would probably get ready and prepare for the interview and really learn about all the different things that they do and mm -hmm. their focus and when they were established and the types of artists that they focus on, right? Um, so I would just advise artists to do the legwork and to now that the art fairs are opening up, yeah. it's, um, it's an amazing opportunity to see a lot of galleries at the same time to talk to people and find out what it is that they might be searching for or um, what kinds of things they have on their rosters or at least look and then get in touch with them later because they're probably going to be really upset that their time is spent <laughs> not selling stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious too. And so with your time in galleries, would you say that was from was the early 2000s until about after the the financial crash crash yeah i left in 2012 and i started in 2005 yeah so with that with that being said you so you worked in an in the in the in the real art industry in boston and, and, and elsewhere probably like for the entirely early 2000s into the early 2010s which is the time that you know this current generation of, of, of art students are not becoming artists or like kind of the, these schools, I don't know, the educations aren't having as much of an impact. I'm curious as to, do you feel like there was a, any kind of cultural shift or change in zeitgeist or in the art world where that was happening? Like, do you feel like an art graduate or maybe, I don't know, like if you were sitting in a gallery in, in 2001, like, do you think that somebody approaching that gallery for representation might have more of an idea of what to do back then or like do you feel like that people are making these stupider moves now <laughs> or it was was it different I think, before i think social media changed hmm. a lot mm. of things because prior to instagram and facebook artists would just walk around with portfolios and approach galleries and uh but with with Instagram, they can have a page that looks like a professional business page and, um, and the gallerists can find them. Um, and that's what the gallerists, I think, have been doing the last um, 10 years or so is they're sitting and flipping through Instagram and, and mm. looking for talent. Um, so in, in that respect, things have gotten a lot easier, I think. Mm. 
for a lot of artists because you can be found directly by people who love your art yeah. um, and the galleries can find you and they can be folks from all over the world they don't necessarily have to be local so um, yeah I wonder if that almost translates more to being more of an advantage for the gallerist even because while well, the gallerist or just these people selling work or uh, doing doing the industry work can have have access to all of these different artists and different information and different uh, people doing these things, but it's it's almost a, it's a, it kind of feels like a two way mirror if that's the right way to um, where I don't know if the artists in that position have the same outlook because they're probably losing a lot of hands on experience where I'm not I'm definitely I don't have a physical portfolio <laughs> at all I have a digital one only yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean so like there's probably you know if i was myself right now in 1999 or even 2009 or something like that would my idea of what i should do to to become to be part of an arts ecosystem would be completely different so yeah. i i wonder if i'm losing in that in that situation where i'm i am the one that's kind of left without a lot of information you know what i mean that i probably should have I, guess. I don't know. I mean, I have no idea what NFTs are. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I don't think you're missing out, really. Because <laughs> that seems to be the, you know... Um, it's a new hot button. It's just whole people thing. Yeah. laundering cryptocurrency, your fake art. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I don't know. And maybe that that speaks to my age and, and the fact that, you know, there are... It, it's just... I'm used to things being done old school. And it's all about... Um, like texture and um mm. so it's it's tough for me to to get to that point hmm. um as an artist but, well yeah. i think too that there's still like i mean i don't think i've i always i used to hear people say shit like that like when i was when i was in school i would hear some professors say or talk about how some people think painting is dead mm -hmm. or like mm. things like that and everything's digital now but like that is i don't think that's true at all and i i don't know man like i think that like no matter how advanced computers or robots get, I mean, like, that that's a painting. Like, this right here, that's a beautiful, textured, and interesting piece of art that's, like, ex that exists in the world. You know what I mean? I don't think that's going to go out of style. I hope not. Or out of fashion. I, I think that that would, be, that would be absurd. <laughs> People go crazy staring at screens all day. People hate screens. People hate Zoom meetings and Facebook like you can people are addicted to it but that doesn't mean we enjoy it <laughs> or that it's firing off dopamine well, a friend of mine just bought um, a tiny little piece digitally I, I don't know how this works once again of a Gerhard Richter painting so she was, I, it was an NFT yeah oh wow um, and, and I don't know like what do you do with that um, how, how do you enjoy that yeah um, you can't yeah. Do you stare at it on your computer screen once in a while? And you're like, oh, that's mine. What I think is most interesting about the NFT market and about digital collectibles in general is that it really, really exposes the completely capitalistic side of selling and buying art where somebody who's buying these paintings or buying something from me, well, I shouldn't generalize. People, someone who's buying a painting from me at my level I'm not like internationally or nationally known or something. If someone buys something from me, it's because they like it. It's not because they they think it's going to grow in value. Mm -hmm. Maybe they have a lot of faith in me, but <laughs> they don't really have any market evidence that it's going to be worth a bunch of money. Yeah. But with NFTs, a lot of the times they really do. So and they it's usually solely for that reason. Exactly. It has absolutely nothing to do with the aesthetics. Maybe it has something to do with the artist. I don't know. But it's. I just think it's really interesting, good or bad, because it's just like everyone nobody's pretending it's just like this is absolutely an exchange of, of value and money and we're hoping we make money Which not is, <laughs> it's really hyper conceptual and really fitting of 2021 though if you think about it because it's a pretty interesting digital trajectory from warhol to hearst to coons to this it's like i don't know when the argument of like art and ownership and if you have a bunch of assistants working in a gallery like the way that um it the coons does it that will print out like a list of this is exactly how you make this piece and he never touches it but they're original works mm -hmm. and that being a hot debate and whether or not that's really his work and that's one of the big reasons why he's so interesting then to have it be this is there isn't an art object <laughs> like it's a digital 
certificate of ownership, I guess. Yeah. What do you think of Jeff Koons? <laughs> well, I actually, in terms of Jeff Koons, I compare him to Michelangelo, mm-hmm. right? Who also had a big studio of assistants who he was giving instructions to and yeah. oh. were so far removed <laughs> from Renaissance painters that we forget that they are not the ones who are painting. Yeah. Wow. Um, that is true. And I think he just sort of brought that back, that it can be a whole manufacturing thing and he can have this idea. Um, and it, it also relates to a lot of people saying, um, with Miro, for instance, every time they look at a Miro, they're like, oh, my kid could do that. Mm. Like, well, <laughs> he didn't. <laughs> Miro did. So he gets credit. Yeah. Because he was the first. And sure, your kid can copy that or your kid can do something similar to yeah. this, but he yeah. didn't actually do it cognizantly right Mm -hmm. um it could have been you know an accident and you are just reading into it as a parent or as an educated parent yeah um but um but with Miro it was years and years of education and thinking about composition and color and line and and shapes and like all of these formal terminology that got him to where he ended up yeah which is really interesting because when you think about something that's so abstracted like that or it's almost like the art object itself is an artifact of the intellectual exploration. Like, it's a physical manifestation of the philosophy versus the worth being contained on the canvas or in the piece. Which oh, I like think... inside of the technical ability mm. of the artist? Yeah, because whether technical ability is displayed in the work or not, it's the context of the entire body of work or what the artist is exploring or whatever that is I guess is really what brings it value some people say like my kid could do this it's like your kid would have to be working on it for a very long time <laughs> like maybe he could but, but at the same time I I have a very hard time at contemporary art museums because mm-hmm. there's so much conceptual work yeah to me it's important to have a visceral reaction mm-hmm. to a piece of art um, so if somebody were like Rothko, I have this very emotional connection to the colors and the way that the paint is um, put on canvas. And um, there's just something about the relationship of all of that together. Whereas if I come in and I'm looking at a pile of dirt and then there's this long ass explanation <laughs> of why this pile of dirt is so important and especially in 2021 that does nothing for me yeah uh, because it, it's just like it it's over the top yeah it's so funny too because i got a critique in college um a couple years ago but they were saying to me that some of my work you couldn't tell what my intention was just by looking at the piece the gallery text would be necessary and I didn't even know what to do with that because I'm like I'm not the only one <laughs> like that's a lot of people do that and I don't know if that's good or bad but it's funny because I feel like anything that you criticize or anything you can say about any piece of work there's somebody doing it that's also being applauded for it hmm. so not even that's not even my opinion necessarily but it's just interesting I'm I'm wondering too, and to, and like talking about conceptual art and these like really, like, uh, kind of ridiculous wall text kind of things. Like, with with your work or what you're doing, how much of like is there? A, are you doing a lot of writing about your concepts or, or why you're making these, or is there like a lot of? Do you feel like you have a kind of ethos or? Uh, I don't know. Like, would there be a big wall of text in a in a gallery show for you? with no. these paintings no because i think it's it is meant to grab you on an emotional level um and there'll be a little bit of a blurb on the technique mm. and on the unique aspects of encaustic versus cold wax mm-hmm. and you know adding in all of the textural elements but in terms of the concept um i just feel like we are so far removed from the world that we live in yeah. And these paintings are an attempt to be a part of that again. Yeah, which kind of brings up the, the, the concept or body of work that you've been doing with the uh, immersive landscapes that are meant to make these 
I guess non-immersive environments feel more more beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Could you talk a little bit about that series of work? Yeah, I think especially during the year of COVID when I've been developing the meditative art rooms, we have been so in our heads in terms of worry and anxiety and fear and not knowing what's going to happen next and not really paying attention to the fact that we live in this beautiful world mm-hmm. and we're lucky to be here yeah and and we're we're not we're not really ever living like in this moment today right um and and these rooms are an attempt to have people be there just in that particular room for 10 minutes if they have 10 minutes uh, 15 minutes if they have 15 minutes uh, but also to allow them to play and experiment I've led dozens and dozens of corporate workshops and the very first thing that people say to me when they sign in um, over zoom last year but also when I do these in person um, is I have no idea why I signed up for this. I don't have a creative bone in my body. And then 20 minutes into it, um, after I say something like, imagine that you're four years old again and you just learned how to make basic shapes and that's all you need to know. Mm. I can see color in their faces. Um, and even though they're these geeky tech, techie people, right, <laughs> that, um, they're a lot more social they're just a lot more present and Mm -hmm. they're allowing themselves to play and I talk about how this is not going to be paint night we're not all going to end up with the same painting at the end of this session Um, it's really about you like each and every one of you and how unique you are and these are all going to look entirely different because each of us is entirely different and they're so surprised at the end that they were able to let go of the end result and just allow themselves to kind of feel the materials and explore. And they do end up with a gorgeous painting or drawing. Um, and it's unique. Every one of them yeah. is completely unique. Um, and it's just been so rewarding to watch people transform that way. Um, and it's been statistically proven that exposure to art, even for 20 minutes a day, decreases your cortisol levels which is our stress hormones really by 75 percent so imagine wow. like 20 minutes 75 percent reduction in stress so does that mean um, engaging with any artwork or making work yourself making work yourself is even more impactful oh wow um because you're in it right mm-hmm. and there's that like fine motor skills connection to the brain and um but even viewing art wow is yeah it's pretty big so these um, meditation rooms, like we've stepped into one for a moment um, in the school, but just to give the listener a visual, are they always um, a room that has like these big landscape paintings in them? Yeah, so the idea is similar to Rothko's idea. They're okay. supposed to be bigger than you, mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. that when you sit there at a certain distance, usually it's about, um, his concept was exactly 18 inches away. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think it needs to be like that specific, but if you sit relatively closely and you are allowing yourself to really be there for like 10 minutes just watching the art, you really feel like you're dissolving into it, like you're part of this landscape and your eye keeps traveling throughout the four different corners and you see more and more elements and um, and you really feel like you stepped out of the office. Yeah. And you stepped into a completely different world. Um, and then if you then allow yourself to listen to these introductory art classes and just kind of experiment with materials, that aids that even more to step out of the day-to-day agenda. Um, let yourself use the other side of the brain yeah. and then come back to it. And I've noticed that people are a lot more focused after these sessions and things kind of shift in your head I have an aha moment every single time I paint and it's usually an aha moment that's connected to like my everyday dilemma Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's what happens to everybody 
on a certain level. So that's so interesting. Do you feel like, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, like, with the analogy of imagine that you're four years old again, you just learned how to draw basic shapes. Like, even just that phrasing and, like, digging into making art like that, especially if you're not a person who usually does, it seems like to be able to do that successfully, you're just releasing a lot of anxiety and, like, self-judgment, I think. So I'm sure doing that for an extended period of time for a workshop or something, like, coming back to the rest of your work, you probably released a lot of tension you didn't know that you had. Yeah, and I'm and with that being said, I'm curious as to know like, did this concept or creating this experience for others for others, kind of it sounds almost like that you're recreating your art making process for other people. Yeah, mm. like you because this is because you you were talking about waking up at, at early hours and doing these mindfulness practices before you work and things like that and like so do you feel like this concept and these rooms and 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 the work creating uh or reducing stress like is this something that you saw in yourself first it definitely is and it is it is teaching people how to get into flow so that their Hmm. life feels more balanced Mm -hmm. that's so flow state is is something that we that almost all of our guests have talked about in different ways and reaching it in different ways and i think it's so uh, interesting because a lot of people find or connect, you know, think of flow state as as art making or something they experience because of art or music or something. And I think it's really interesting that you've kind of. Uh, it almost feels like you're the, the way you're talking about this is almost scientific. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Where you have like this information backing up what you're talking about. It isn't like it, it's almost. It's not even. It's like. It's like almost like proving something spiritual which i think is really interesting because a lot of people i feel like concepts like this are usually addressed through spirituality or Mm -hmm. you know uh or art therapy it sounds like there's a lot of tenets of art therapy or art-based research in this which is really interesting to me (laughs) that was my major but um yeah that's really neat have you like you say you've been doing you've done a lot of these workshops by now right yeah so were you doing them before covid as well yes yeah okay yes so have you gotten a lot of feedback from people or like different experiences that stuck with you after doing this with like almost like patients like seeing the difference in their workflow or the way that they feel or what they've said to you about it i started doing more critiques towards the end Mm -hmm. because towards the end when the product is complete and all of a sudden something clicks in their heads they're like oh now it's judgment hour Mm. um they go back to their old self-judging selves and it's (laughs) very important at that point to tell them what worked Mm -hmm. and the fact that this was a huge step for them to engage in this type of an activity and they actually accomplished something pretty major because if you don't do that then they leave with that really low Mm self-worth element they're like oh you know this came out like crap i'm just Mm -hmm. never gonna sign up again um but there are tons of people that um sign up over and over and over again and i think that speaks volumes about the importance of the particular flow within the class but also the fact that they got into flow yeah during class you can kind of carry that out into other spaces yeah I'm, uh, I'm curious as to know, too, that I feel like a lot of people who who don't get to experience a kind of flow state or don't really know how to reach it or uh, maybe are dealing with, like, anxiety or work stress or something, like, a lot of people feel like, uh, you know, worrying about finances or their job or looking at screens all the time or being in these kind of, like, you know, fluorescent environments almost. Like, a lot of people feel like that's, like, soul-sucking and, and it creates so much stress, you know what I mean? And you know, uh, someone like you is like creating or helping people reach flow state or talking about different ways to do that or, uh, experiencing, you know, this is the, the, a kind of, that it seems like a kind of mission that you have with your work. I guess I'm kind of wondering what your thoughts are on like maybe an artist who does experience flow state and makes beautiful work or, you know, loves what they do, but then they have to get on the computer or like, um do like you know networking or emailing or on their phone or like like you know all these like professional things like do you feel like there's a I guess I'm wondering if you could speak on that balance because I know a lot of people who 
just the idea of documenting their work and photographing it or putting together a portfolio is like a too, too much work, <laughs> you know what I mean? Or just strip, let alone trying to promote it yeah. or meet people that could help them professionally, you know, like, do you, I guess I'm wondering if you could speak on that, that dilemma or if you have found yourself in a, in a situation like that. Yeah, for sure. I think that's the imposter syndrome um, mm -hmm. talking because you can be in the flow state and you can be creating something really magnificent, but then as soon as it's done and for the longest time, I hated my paintings as soon as they were done because it was a defense mechanism because mm -hmm. in a way I knew that I need to now start selling them. And if I hate them first, then mm -hmm. if someone rejects me, it's not as painful. Oh, uh, <laughs> right. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, and, and I think that's the case for a lot of artists, uh, like that perfectionism that mm -hmm. steps in towards the end, um, that it's never going to be quite done because I don't want to get to a point where I actually have to talk about it and, mm -hmm. you know, and sell it and do something with it. Yeah. Um, and, and it's, and it's really tough. And I think a lot of it has to do with, belief in in yourself and in the fact that it is good enough to to face the world and there is a lot of rejection mm -hmm. a ton of rejection like you know you have to reach a hundred people for 10 of them to maybe say yes and you're lucky if they do yeah um and it's just really really tough um so that's so that's the part where i think a lot of us fail yeah is is that that self-confidence and dealing with rejection professionally and stuff? And knowing that the fact that they reject you has nothing to do with you. Mm. I'm curious too, is, is your experience in, in, the, in the art world, do you feel like that helped you a lot with your, with your confidence as somebody that was probably on the other side of some situations like that in the past? Like, cause maybe, maybe a, somebody working at a gallery might have to reject somebody and you know, in your heart, it's not like because this person was some terrible idiot who was <laughs> foolish or their art was terrible but it may have been purely a completely practical normal rejection because of i don't know business reasons or something <laughs> something totally it's actually the opposite i think my gallery experience made it a lot harder oh wow because i knew the conversations that take place mm. oh. and, and um and the first people that I went to when I started promoting my work were people in the gallery world because they that you were probably people knew. I knew. Oh, yeah. And and hearing their responses was like a knife <laughs> piercing through my heart because yeah. they're like, oh, these are decorative and they're not really what, you know, we would be looking for. And, you know, in translation, that means we think that's not good enough for gotcha. us to yeah. is that what the, Is that what people are saying when they, because I, I hear that kind of often as a, that decor, decorative versus whatever the, the opposite of decorative is. Like, I guess, what, what do you think of that? Do you think that that's just some some like bullshit <laughs> dichotomy or like it, it is and it's not like i don't think there's anything wrong with decorative right i i you know now that i've been through this for a number of years i i know that these are decorative and yeah. people will put them in their houses to make them look better isn't right? that the point yeah, <laughs> for... yeah exactly um but to your point of what your professors were saying in college mm. and how um, everything needs to have a particular concept or mm. yeah. um, theme or ethos, like you mm -hmm. said. Um, that's what they're referring to. Like if it's just something mm. that's coming from your heart and you don't particularly have an explanation for it, yeah, that's decorative. It might not be relatable because to you're not because you because there's no concept. There's yeah. no real concept behind. Oh, that's such a dig. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> think about it. <laughs> something that we've talked about with, I think, on other past episodes and stuff is that the kind of analogy that a lot of artists that have to sell their or that want to sell their work or be involved, you know, do something professionally. It isn't just about being good at making art, but it's almost like learning how to write ad copy mm -hmm. or like work. It's like you're learning how to work in marketing. Yeah. But, you know, and like that's probably where imposter syndrome is kind of like a a good and evil kind of thing where it's like 
you know, you create this like product and this like way to sell it and this pitch and this and that. And if it isn't your heart and soul, Mm -hmm. it doesn't hurt that bad. But also if it isn't your heart and soul, it probably doesn't feel that authentic. Yeah. And people can smell that. And that's a place where (laughs) the way that art school structure kind of fails a lot of students too, I think, because that marketing and that business sense isn't taught. Well, I think the dichotomy there is between, you know, when you're creating your art, you're creating for yourself, Mm -hmm. hopefully, right? Uh, And there are a lot of artists that have made it that I know that because they've made it, they're forced to create the same thing over and over Mm -hmm. and over again Uh. because it sells. Yeah. But if you are creating for yourself, you're not really thinking about the end user. But when you put things up on your website and you have to write copy it should be about them Mm -hmm. and not about you anymore. So, you know, nobody cares that you went to Italy and you had this beautiful vacation. What they care about is that they went to Italy (laughs) and that's where their honeymoon was and that's what they want to remember. And so it's moving from me, me, me Mm -hmm. to them um, and making it about them. And that's that's really the hard part Um, in the sales process. (laughs) That does sound really difficult because at the same time so much of the world and people's peers or the art world even or even art schools are kind of demanding that you really reach in there and do something that means so like has this like high concept that has so much to do with who you are and your identity Mm. so it's kind of a weird full circle problem (laughs) (laughs) it's pretty interesting so I I guess on that topic you do have gallery representation Mm-hmm. right now and that um what was it called invoke yeah. invoke gallery yeah. yeah is that and are they is that based in boston based in boston yeah we've um so this is it's a co-op gallery oh wow that we put together cool um with another artist slash gallery um person and a couple of other artists and we've traveled to a number of art fairs together um and it's been quiet you know, this past year, because we really haven't sure. really done much. Mm-hmm. Um, nobody has, um, and everyone's been kind of on their own. Um, and then there are a couple of, there's a gallery that I have a show with right now um, in Chestnut Hill um, that, Mine. yeah, um, and um, prepping for a show um, in Brookline in Coach Corner, um, and then another one in Lexington in October. Busy. Um, so, um Thank God I have a lot of art. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. That's so there should be there should be, and I just installed a beautiful um, lobby show in Cambridge. Wow. Um, that's going to be up for six months with Decordova. Um, so, um, so that was really exciting. That's yeah. lovely. So that has it been picking up like this this upcoming season is when it's been picking up for you since the pandemic then. Probably yeah, because yeah. people are starting to. I I had a completely dead show in January and February and I knew that it was going to be dead yeah Mm -hmm. Um, it was in Framingham and um, Saxon Mills and this beautiful beautiful industrial space kind of like SOA um, and a lot of galleries originated there and then went to SOA um, and yeah it was it looked gorgeous but no one showed up yeah Mm. (laughs) um, and same for the Chestnut Hill show it's you know people are still kind of figuring their way out yeah of COVID so did you have um this is something we've been asking all of our guests because I feel like it's just interesting to hear but um you were saying that when you first kind of got back into full-time painting when you uh, left your gallery job that it was a really emotional time and that it was a lot of introspection and kind of getting back to the roots of why you were doing what you were doing did you have another moment like that during the pandemic or during lockdown at all where you kind of turned to your art during that time oh yeah yeah huge it was it was the way to survive um to kind of stay sane Mm. because otherwise with three kids doing zoom classes all day um (laughs) it was just uh, exhausting really really daunting um and and that's how the idea of those meditative art rooms came about about that was a huge aha moment because i i was seeing how important and impactful this practice was for me Mm -hmm. and for all of these kids and adults that i was teaching and i just really wanted more people to experience this um and and seeing how 
cooped up and how much struggle there was in terms of burnout and overwhelm mm. and extreme I, th- I think we're going to be dealing with this for years and years mm. the extreme anxiety and yeah. depression that people are not really allowing themselves to admit they had mm-hmm. um and you know even with our kids you know so many kids that were like virtual and did not see a person for months and months and months yeah. i mean that's just not the way a human operates yeah so mm-hmm. huh. So when you initially had that um, feeling of kind of being so introspective with your work and getting back into it, what kind of meaning did you draw from it then? Because I feel like we almost glossed over that. Like, was it a similar kind of thing of just getting back to the roots of it and like mindfulness and things like that? Or do you think that was hammered home more because of the isolation of the pandemic? I think back then it was about seeing who I truly was and Mm -hmm. what my purpose in life was because it was like a rat's race for money Mm. yeah that's what the gallery world is you know who makes more money it's not really about the art yeah um and i really cared about the art Mm. uh like the actual process of making art viewing art introducing people to art and and i think during the during the pandemic i i just really wanted to help mm-hmm. somehow and i and and i knew that this helps a lot um and it can help a lot more people than i can currently cover with my art school and the the workshops that i'm running and um yeah. and it can impact thousands millions they just don't know yeah what it is it kind of brings the benefits of art making to people that don't even consider themselves artists. It's not kind of, it does. So that's really interesting to think about as a tool. Hmm. That's heavy. Yeah. <laughs> it was a lot. Yeah. Wow. What beautiful stuff. So yeah, you are, you know, making all these beautiful pieces. You have so many upcoming shows. You're running the school. That's exciting. Oh, we didn't talk about your, your fashion line. Oh, yeah. So what is it called? <laughs> uh, it's called Gallerista. So it's um, kind of going back to the gallery roots. That's the one thing that I really missed is the cool outfits. Yeah. <laughs> really? So that's, that is that is the kind of inspiration for, the, yeah. for those, that yeah. aesthetic is the yeah. kind of gallery. Yeah. Mm. So, you know, the, the person who works an art fair, uh, yeah. a booth at an art fair, or goes to an art fair and just really thinks about presenting themselves to the world in a way that is stylish um, but practical Mm. Um, very um, classical in a lot of ways um, but edgy at the Mm -hmm. same time Um, so and um, and I thought of the idea right before the pandemic started (laughs) so it was (laughs) it was very unfortunate in terms of timing uh, because I had all these trunk shows planned last summer and obviously none of that happened. Mm. Yeah. Um, but it, it was good because I, I did a lot of research and I went back to that dream of the five-year-old to, to be a fashion designer and, um, and showed myself that anything can be done. It's just yeah. a matter of doing it. And speaking of, of, of your roots, are, I, I forget where, I think I read this on, on the website, the clothes are, are manufactured they are. in your home country? Yeah, yeah. How did you, how did you arrange that, that type of deal? Um, that's was that the, difficult? Was that, that was, really, <laughs> that sounds incredibly complicated. Um, it was interesting because during the, so during the pandemic, since nobody could really go anywhere, mm-hmm. I found local tailors um, and they pretty much made all of my sample like the first line the sample items from the first line for me oh like local tailors local, around here yeah in mm-hmm. newton and it was just ridiculously expensive <laughs> and there was it just made no sense to be there was no way that i could sell anything and actually make even a dollar right. yeah. yeah i was losing um and then i um i was thinking about how to move forward and was going through cleaning out my closet and saw a jacket um, that I got, you know, years ago from Montclair. And it said made in Moldova. I'm like, wait, 
if this is made in Moldova, <laughs> then other things <laughs> can be made in Moldova. And then yeah. I went back to some of my old classmates. I left when I was 13 and I just started asking around, do you know anyone? Um, wow. Can I, because uh, that would be a really, really cool thing to give back mm. in this way. Um, and I found a really wonderful woman and I've been working with her for a year. Um, I had a trunk show mid-June that was incredible. Um, went over really, really well. And I am having another one um, in a couple of weeks on August 5th, if you guys wanna come. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so it just sort of was delayed by a year. Do you ever but go back and visit? It. I have, uh, well, I've gone back once hmm. in 2001. So wow. that was oh, 20 years ago. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Ages ago. But I really do want to go and actually meet her in person and yeah. um, see what things are like these days. Wow. Yeah. That's so cool to be able to have orchestrated that too. And kind of like a pretty DIY way also, just like through, was it like Facebook messaging? Like people that you had gone yeah. to school with? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's really cool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. And then there was one last thing that I saw on your website as well, that you're working on a public installation in uh, Venice coming up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's pretty exciting. Oh, well, yeah. Could yeah. you tell us about that? What what exactly, or like, what is the significance of this, this fair or this um, show? So the Venice Biennale mm -hmm. is the largest event in the world. And what happens is that every two years, you know, biannual, um, mm -hmm. every country proposes um, an artist mm -hmm. uh, and that's sort of the main pavilions yeah. where they have everything set up but also just like with some of the other fairs like Freeze and Art Basel Miami there are lots of satellite things happening mm. all over Venice so something happens like on every corner wow. and I was approached by somebody who saw my art in Santa Fe and saw that there's a lot of European reference there hmm. Um, to put together a proposal for Venice. Um, so I wanted to focus it on Venice and kind of bring together all of my different hats. Mm -hmm. So this is actually the first piece. Um, oh, wow. It's beautiful. And, um, and I'm traveling to Venice mid-August to do more sketches um, and to come up with the second piece. And there will still be two pieces and people will be sent on a quest throughout oh, wow. Venice oh. <laughs> to, um, to discover different sections. So there'll be clues, you know, there are clues within each painting that kind of send them to talk to a gondolier, right? And talk, wow. have, uh, sending them to talk to a mask shop owner and, um, and learn a bit about what Venice really is like um, and all the art history that um, is right there in, in front of them in Venice. And there'll also be two outfits that are inspired by Venice. <laughs> so it's kind of so an all immersive show. Yeah. Wow. So it'll be two large installations. Two large paintings. pieces, yeah. And two outfits and a quest. And then people will be encouraged to do their own sketches yeah. when they're in Venice and then submit them through um, a competition and one of them will be chosen as the next print for my clothing line. That's so interesting. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So just for the listener, just because I'm curious also, does it cost any money to go to that event other than the travel and everything? Like, um, there is, yeah, because they are doing all the installation. They have people manning the show because I'm not going to, it runs for six months. Yeah. So oh, I'm yeah. not, not going to be there, you know, all of six months. I'm just going to come for mm -hmm. the opening or the yeah. closing or what I can arrange. Um, so, yes, there is there is a fee to participate. So I'm also looking for sponsorships, yeah. mm. um, cor corporate sponsorships and saving up on my own and I did a fundraising campaign as well wow. like a Kickstarter that must be wow. such an honor though for such a historic event because I think I was reading about it today and it was established in like the late 1800s yeah very yeah. very important yeah so that's, so that's really so that's exciting. really exciting yeah wow. now, with uh with Miami uh Basel were you showing there too I was in one of the satellite fairs oh my gosh that must yeah. have been exciting yeah, is it a super busy that. time in, oh, in Miami insane. that day it's crazy yeah <laughs> Wow. Like, there's so much art um, that you take in throughout the week 
that you don't want to look at art for, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know for at least a couple of months but it's so worth it it's yeah. wow uh, yeah so worth it so what was that installation like um, well they have um, they have a lot of different art fairs um, I think it's more than 20 or 30 art fairs right now and within each art fair there's a number of galleries that mm -hmm. have their booths so we set up as a booth and mm -hmm. we were representing we were taking turns kind of repping the gallery in the booth um, but during our free time we could visit the other art fairs and the main art Basel fair yeah. so um, it's it's just a very happening weekend there yeah. are tons of week actually it's a whole week wow. um, there are tons of VIP parties and after fair events and special collector gatherings and it's yeah that's so interesting very cool. I can't imagine you should go I'm yeah that. I'm like, yeah what the hell to <laughs> make yeah. that happen yeah, <laughs> yeah. wow yeah, well, you know, I, I feel like I say this so much when we're recording, but like our main, like one of our main criteria that we look for with people to interview is just people with unique and just interesting perspectives, you know, and like I, I didn't know really what to expect coming here to talk, but like this has been a, a beautiful and educational and <laughs> really interesting. <laughs> I think you have a really interesting story, especially in uh, in contrast to a lot of the other people that we have interviewed I think that like this is like um it's unique to hear somebody who has extensive experience on both sides like the gallery side and the um fine art side because it is true that a lot of people that are in the gallery world you talk to them and if they had an art practice or something it's usually they do it on the weekends or it comes second to the yeah. gallery job yeah so it's almost like would you say that it was a blessing to have that breaking point of like it has to be full-time or nothing do you yeah. think you would have stayed with it if you had had the choice to go part-time I, yeah, I probably would have never, yeah, it would probably just be a, a, a Sunday painter type yeah. of thing, hmm. yeah. Knowing all that you know now, would you ever go back to running a gallery full-time? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good and I've, been, I, <laughs> and I've been, every six months, my old boss calls me, he's like, hey, just <laughs> open the gallery on Nantucket, do you want to run oh, it? Oh, wow. Like, nope. <laughs> I'm good. Thank you. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Sought after. Yeah, that's got to be really, really valuable experience that a lot of people would probably look for. Because, I mean, forget about, you know, art mentorships or something. If I was, I'm, I'm not, but if I was an aspiring gallerist or somebody who wanted to work in that field, you're definitely somebody that I would want to talk to just to hear about yeah. your different experiences and knowledge and stories from from your time doing that kind of yeah i don't know it's kind of funny i said to theo i think earlier today or before we came here that if i wanted to like because if i had wanted to talk to somebody who had that kind of experience in the art world i don't think i would have had any idea who to call <laughs> or how to like what like I, I don't even i don't know so this is like yeah. a really interesting uh because we wanted to talk to you just as an artist and to hear about your work and what you do and stuff so but i had i didn't realize that you had that much of a background That's one of many hats <laughs> yeah yeah so this has been super valuable to me yeah Thank you. i'm glad oh, i agree yeah feel free anytime <laughs> yeah absolutely to, we're yeah we are at um I get uh, an hour and 30 minutes now, oh which God. is, oh, wow. a, yeah, that flew by, huh? Yeah. yeah. That's so fun. And so speaking uh, of networking events, I should be at one in like 10 minutes. <laughs> oh, geez. Yeah. So we'll get out of here. This was uh, super fun. Awesome. Thank you yeah, so much for, you. for talking yeah. to us. And uh, I guess I'll throw your, your Instagram and websites and the things. So all the people listening know where to find your shows and your work. Yeah, if there's so. any other details you want us to put in, like things coming up or something, just let us know. We'll put it oh, in. Oh, yeah, we could. Okay. Text yeah. info. And yeah. we will uh, contact you with the accurate information as to when this will be uploaded. I think okay. Which should 30th. be three weeks. The 30th. The 30th. Okay, yeah. cool. All right, great. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Hell yeah, Boston Art Podcast. Thank yeah. you so much. <laughs>